Hello and welcome to a post-debate damage report with me, John Adderola, very excited to have you here. We've got so much coming up on this show. We've got a candidate, we've got Kenny Clips, we've got 10 things that you desperately need to know about Mike Bloomberg. In fact, we have so much that you know what, we're just gonna get started right now. Is a contested convention going to happen? Well, if you look at the sort of odds makers in the political world, it is certainly a possibility. Take a look at this chart from 538 showing that uh, the chance that no one has a majority of pledged delegates is slightly higher than any individual candidate. Bernie Sanders has the best chance, about 37%. Uh, but they appear to think that there's pretty good odds that we're gonna have a contested convention where someone comes into the convention, they've got the most delegates, but not enough to clearly clinch this thing. And if that is the case, and in particular, if it's Bernie Sanders, then what happens? Maybe the party gets involved and chooses someone that the voters did not. Now, I will preface all of the rest of this by saying I don't think the odds of that are as high as 538. Now, I'm not, you know, a well paid statistician and political forecaster or anything, um, but I'm looking ahead to Super Tuesday where Bernie Sanders has the lead in basically every state of St. Paul other than Alabama. And uh, a lot of people, I'm not saying them, but a lot of people are saying, well, there's so many candidates that are gonna be running in all these races. I mean, five, six, seven, eight candidates, they're all gonna be splitting the delegates. Doesn't that mean that even if Bernie wins, he's not gonna get that many delegates from each individual state? And I get what you're saying, but here's the thing, at a certain point, more candidates means that everybody gets less delegates. But you can pass that point into way too many candidates, which means that very few of them will actually pass the threshold to get any delegates at all. In which case, those who do get even more delegates than they would have otherwise. So I'm not sure that it's going to happen. But if it does happen, it is certainly something to be worried about. And in particular, coming out of the debate last night, because one of the big things that was sort of commented on when it happened and then everyone forgot about it, was when Chuck Todd asked all of the candidates on the stage, if somebody arrives at the convention with the most delegates but not half, do you pledge to support the person who has the most at that point? And Bernie Sanders, who it looks like is gonna be that guy, he said yes, obviously you follow the will of the people, they will have supported this candidate the most. Um, so that's good for Bernie Sanders. Uh, there were five other people on the stage though, and what did they have to say? No, 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 that's five, right? All of them, I wanna make sure that you know that all of them said, no, we're gonna let the process play out. We're gonna follow the DNC rules. And that is interesting for a couple of different reasons. Um, but one, I think we should definitely know. And in fact, I'm going to extend an olive branch to Chris Matthews, who I've been criticizing a lot lately, and allow him to be the one who gets the credit for acknowledging this. Take a look at this video. But there's only one candidate there who believes he's gonna have the most delegates going into Milwaukee. And we know it was, he was the guy that said that person should be the winner. Everybody else said tonight, I will not have the most delegates. They all made it official. They were not gonna give the win to the guy with the, or the person with the most delegates. That was so telling tonight. Today, it was an acknowledgement that Bernie is the winner, not the winner, the winner so far in this whole fight. And he may be the winner all the way, and I think they think so. He might be the winner, no, 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 we're not, he's not the winner yet, but, uh, but no, Chris Matthews was right there. Um, you know what, and I appreciate him pointing that out. So you know what, we're not gonna drag him to uh, Central Park. I'm kidding, that would never happen. Um, but what he's saying is true, all of those other five are not just saying they follow the rules, they like the process. They're saying, I'm definitely not gonna be the one with the most delegates, which is look, I like it when politicians can acknowledge reality and they're all doing that. Bernie Sanders is almost certainly gonna be the one who has the most delegates. But you know what, I even hate that sentence I just said because it is so sanitary. Yes, he will be the one with the most delegates, but what does that actually mean? It means he will be the one that the most people supported. And in an ostensible democracy, it seems kind of important who got the most votes. I know that that's sort of out of vogue. It's not fashionable to care about who gets the most votes. We've got all these systems set up to make sure that that's not actually what determines who wins. We saw that in practice in Iowa actually, where Bernie got the most votes, but like narrowly Buttigieg won somehow. Uh, that made me sick. It always makes me sick when that plays out. Hopefully it makes you sick too, to see five of the six candidates on the stage say, I don't care what the voters say at the end of the day. They can support whoever the hell they want. I'm holding out to be chosen by the powerful inside the Democratic Party. That's what I'm here for. I'm not even really trying to convince you anymore because I don't think I can do it. I don't think I have it in me. So screw you, screw your vote. 
I'm gonna go to the convention and I'm gonna see if maybe they pick me. I'm gonna make the case for why I'm the guy that you should choose as the middle finger you're gonna hold up to all of the voters. That's what they're all saying. Um, and, and I can't believe that we're coming out of this debate without more people acknowledging that. How obviously wrong that is, how obviously undemocratic inside of the Democratic Party that that would be. And I think that if you do acknowledge this, if it bothered you too, you need to be yelling it from the rooftops and make sure that all of the Democrats know, those who would be doing the picking, the superdelegates, but also those five candidates, that if they continue to go down this inherently, fundamentally undemocratic road, that you will never support them for literally anything again. And I don't care what fancy arguments they try to come up with to excuse this ridiculous argument from last night. So Yumiche Alcindor tweeted out, Elizabeth Warren was on MSNBC and she said, we need to pick a nominee who can beat Donald Trump. And that means we gotta have someone who's talking to all parts of the party, it's important. Okay, that sounds good until you know that she said that in response to why do you think the person who got the most delegates shouldn't win? Okay, we need to have someone who beats Donald Trump, I agree. That's one of the reasons I'm supporting Bernie Sanders. All the polls show that he's going to do that. Um, but it's on the voters to decide who their candidate is. And Elizabeth Warren doesn't wanna say, but she's saying, I don't trust Democratic voters to choose the right person. And so thankfully, we've got some Democratic insiders, you know, old people who've been in the party forever, that are gonna make the right decision. You guys can play with your primaries and your caucuses, but we're gonna fix this thing. Don't worry about all this stuff. Have fun with your primary, have fun with your uh, caucuses. In the end, we're gonna decide, and hopefully they'll decide for me. Okay, that's unacceptable, and you need to make clear to everyone that that is the case. With that, let's lighten things up just a little bit and talk about Bernie. It is seeming pretty apparent at this point that Bernie Sanders is gonna have a good Super Tuesday. He's already doing incredibly well. And here's the thing, to some people in the mainstream media, it's like shocking that he's doing as well as he is. It's shocking that Biden fell apart, but to some of us, this is what we've been predicting for quite a long time. And I saw a video online, I wanna give credit to Bernie Watchdog on Twitter, who put together a little quick best of, best of montage of people counting out Bernie Sanders literally every step of the way in this campaign. Coming to you live from Las Vegas, Bernie Sanders has the inside track to the Democratic nomination. Let me repeat, Bernie Sanders, he's done. I see Bernie Sanders realizing he won't be in the top five and dropping out. I think Bernie's time, be careful. I don't understand why he's running now. They need to start knocking some candidates out. Otherwise, the Democratic Party is gonna nominate Bernie Sanders. For the Democrats to win, they have to knock Bernie out early. If it's clear that you are not gonna be the nominee, will you leave the race? I intend to be the nominee. But Bernie Sanders is the most stubborn politician. Stubborn old Go. Was yelling, was screaming, screaming, screaming in the same screechy voice. His time has come and passed. Coming out of Iowa, I would bet on Biden being there. Harris, Warren, Kamala, Cory Booker, Michael Bennett. I think there's a lot of pressure on Bernie. It doesn't appear that there's growth. Should he be thinking about throwing in the towel? Your polling numbers have gone down a little bit. Just happened to bring it with me. Incredible. Is Bernie done? <laughs> Bernie Sanders was just released from the hospital. We shouldn't expect to see him on the campaign trail in the foreseeable future. Okay, so that's only the first half. You should definitely watch the full thing. Go to Bernie Watchdog on Twitter. But but yeah, just the patronizing, literally from January, like Bernie Sanders, he narrowly lost Hillary Clinton. How could he possibly think he has a chance this time around? And every step of the way, they were like, what does he think he's doing? Biden has got this thing, he's gonna destroy this thing. It was so obvious to them. And here's the thing, from the very beginning, what were we saying? Obviously about Bernie's baked in support, I don't need to convince you that we predicted that obviously. But about Biden, we've been saying from the very beginning, before he actually launched his race, yes, he has a lot of name recognition. Yes, he's affiliated with Barack Obama and the Obama administration, people are gonna, people are gonna like that. But he's a terrible campaigner, he's a terrible debater. He just can't get it done in this campaign, he never has. And he's run multiple times over multiple decades. And yet we kept saying that, and look, at some point, the fact that he kept sort of his numbers stayed up debate after debate when he would give a fumbling, flailing, corn poppy performance. I started to question myself, but I knew that this is who Biden was, that at some point he was gonna falter. And so we stuck to our guns, and here's the thing. All those people that you saw in that montage, and yes, I get some of them have occasionally said a nice thing about Bernie Sanders. I'm not saying that they've all tried to destroy him at every step of the way, but all of them, we're fundamentally wrong about how this Democratic primary was going to play out. And yet CNN and MSNBC filled the airwaves with these pundits and these voices and these think tankers and all that. 
because supposedly they're the ones who know how things go in politics. Are any of them gonna have less screen time now that they were 100% wrong about Biden and Bernie Sanders in this thing? Any of them? I was supposed to be on Cuomo a few times, I haven't yet made it, I've gotten bumped, maybe it'll happen. Cuomo does have progressives, especially from TYT on, and that's great. Um, but all the people who were calling it a year ago that Biden was inevitably gonna fail, when we were mocked, but we were right, are they then gonna say, well, God, well, I mean, we've been, we've been failing our audience. We've been putting a whole bunch of know nothings on the screen, and just like not one time did we understand the fundamental uh, what was going on in this Democratic primary. Are they gonna learn from it? Are they gonna bring on new voices? Are they gonna perhaps rely on people who have been proven right? I kind of doubt it, but maybe we can tweet at them. Maybe we can put a little bit of pressure. Because they also have some predictions about the general election. I have a feeling they might be wrong about those two. Okay, with that, we are gonna take a short break. When we come back, congressional candidate Mike Siegel is gonna join us after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Joining us now is a candidate in Texas's 10th district, a congressional candidate, Mike Siegel. Welcome to the Damage Report. Thanks so much, John. Great to be on with you. Uh, very glad to have you here. Um, there's a couple different aspects of your platform. Uh, very uh, excited to talk to you about. And uh, in particular, I'm always enthusiastic about candidates running in Texas because I lived there up until just a few years ago. Uh, very excited to see it move in a more progressive direction. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about your background uh, in both law and education. You're coming at this from a little bit of a different angle than, than some other candidates do. So tell me a little bit about how your background uh, is influencing your campaign. Sure, I'm a former public school teacher. I was active in the teachers union, uh, and I've also been a civil rights lawyer and a city attorney for the city of Austin. And so really I'm running a movement style campaign that's heavy on community organizing. We've mobilized uh, hundreds of volunteers already this cycle in the Texas 10th. We've knocked over 34,000 doors. So really that mobilizing the people, building a broad coalition is a part of my campaign. And then on the lawyer side, uh, you know, most recently in Texas, I was a city attorney in Austin. And was a big part of multiple lawsuits where we were taking on the Republican legislature and the Republican governor, uh, including a lawsuit to stand up for the immigrant community. In 2017, they passed a show me your papers law. And I was the lead lawyer for the city of Austin, mm. uh, basically standing up for undocumented folks uh, on behalf of this idea of a progressive Texas. And so that's really been a big part of the work. You know, In that case, we brought together the biggest cities in Texas to sue the governor. That was the first time this has ever happened. You know, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, El Paso, and Austin. And it really showed what's possible here, that there's this progressive beating heart, especially in the cities and on the border. And if we can mobilize all these folks, we can take this state. You know, uh, over the past few years, uh, one of the people in the Trump administration that has frustrated me and a lot of people, perhaps the most, is Betsy DeVos and her really perverse approach to education policy. Um, with, with your background as a public school teacher, uh, if you were in Congress, you could be helping to influence education policy at the federal level. What direction would you like to see our country go when it comes to schooling and education? 
Well, big picture, we need to protect public education. You know, the same way that we're fighting for universal health care, we need universal, strong public schools. And unfortunately, this Betsy DeVos movement, the charter school movement, is really about privatizing public education and profiting off of public education. You know, even if you've seen a good charter school or two, that movement overall is about taking slices of what are currently public resources, whether it's the janitorial department of a school, uh, the, the textbook department, uh, the food services, and it's it's creating profit centers for each of these aspects of public education. And it's taking money away from the students uh, who need it most. And so we need to stand up for strong public schools. We need to raise funding. We need to support teachers, have better paid teachers and better trained teachers, reduce class sizes and things of that nature. So uh, I love that the Green New Deal is uh, one of the central parts of your, your platform. Um, I, I'm curious though, uh, so you've mentioned, I, I believe in interviews that while you've received a number of high profile endorsements and you know, feel free to let people know about those, that um, for some groups, your support for the Green New Deal has apparently hurt your chances of getting those endorsements. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, in this race, you know, I've received pretty much every local endorsement you can get, including from labor, which is extremely important to me. You know, I was a teachers union member when I was a city attorney. I was active in AFSME, the city employees union. And my campaign has been unionized uh, both in 2018 and this cycle, one of the few congressional campaigns to unionize. And so I thought it would be a no brainer for the AFL CIO uh, to endorse me. And the Austin Labor Council on one end of the district was unanimous for me. But on the Houston side, where half of the workers are in the fossil fuel industries, uh, there was a little bit of a, of a hiccup. You know, these folks, when I say those three words, Green New Deal, it gives folks a lot of pause. And so a few weeks ago, there was the Texas AFL-CIO convention, which is when all the unions in the state come together to basically vote on which candidates to support. And I had to spend three days basically caucusing with every union in the state, uh, from the communication workers to a lot of the fossil fuel industries, you know, the seafarers union that operates the ships in the, mm. the port of Houston, the, the steel workers who operate the refineries. And I basically had to ne negotiate with these folks, really just let them know where I'm coming from, what I'm about, that I ne think we do need to take very strong action on climate change. But at the same time, we really need to honor this idea of a just transition. And so that when I go to Congress, yes, I'm gonna support a Green New Deal, but I'm gonna make sure labor's at the table and we're not gonna take action on what is essentially a national jobs program until labor's comfortable with what we can put together. And so after all that work we did, I ultimately endured earned the support of the Texas AFL-CIO. I think 68 out of 70 unions that voted on my endorsement supported me. And that included a lot of these fossil fuel workers who may not support the, the concept of a Green New Deal or at least the hashtag, but they trusted that I would fight for them as part of this process of fighting climate okay. change. Now let's talk just briefly about your your possible opponents. You have the the Republican incumbent Michael McCall, uh, who's been in that seat for you know what seems like fifty years or so, uh, but certainly a long time. And uh, you've run against him before, and it was a it was a fairly close race. So tell me a little bit about who he is and why things could be different this time. So Michael McCall is another one of these oligarchs. Uh, he's worth three hundred million dollars. His wife is the heiress to the Clear Channel Media fortune. And basically, after they gerrymandered Texas in 2003, this guy, he bought the Republican nomination with several million dollars and put his feet up after that because the district was gerrymandered to be permanently Republican. And so fast forward to 2018, this guy is chairman of Homeland Security. He's allowing the family separation policy to happen. He's supporting the government shutdown for a border wall. He's voting to take away our health care. And I decided to run against him. Uh, nobody thought I had a chance in heck of winning, of course because of his money and the map as it's drawn. But we put together a strong grassroots coalition, over a thousand volunteers, labor, environmental, youth groups. Uh, we made over 300,000 voter contacts and lowered McCall's advantage from 19% to 4% in one cycle. And so now in 2020, this is a national battleground district and I'm running to finish the job. Okay, and where can people find out more about your run? Well, thank you. Uh, so Mike Siegel, if you can spell my name, uh, Siegelfortexas.org. Uh, we've got a website, uh, Siegel for Texas on Twitter and, and Facebook. Um, so folks can definitely sign up to, to follow uh, the campaign. Of course, any grassroots contributions help. We have a March 3 primary and we're, we're trying to win outright on March 3rd against two conservative primary challengers who are attacking me from the right. Okay, Mike Siegel, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, John, it's an honor. We're gonna take a short break here. Uh, when we come back, let's talk a little bit about who Mike Bloomberg is after this.
So maybe you're curious about this Mike Bloomberg guy. Maybe you saw him on the debate stage. Maybe you've seen one of his ads where he's eating ice cream or his face is photoshopped onto a meatball or something like that. It's funny, but let's let's be honest with each other. It doesn't really tell you much about who he is, what he believes, what he wants to do. And so I wanna help out. In case you are curious about Mike, Mike Bloomberg, here are 10 things you should probably know about him. So uh, he had this to say back in 1999 in an off the record conversation. My daughter is tall and busty and blonde. We went to China together and what's a 16 year old going to do on a business trip? He pops another carefully buttered piece of bread in his mouth. So I got her dates in every city in China. Then he yelled at the guy who was listening, that's off the record. That's a very weird thing to say about your daughter, not unprecedented. To be fair, Donald Trump does talk about his daughter in that very same way, about how she's tall and busty and blonde and how you gotta hook her up with people as you travel around the country. There are other things you could do, presumably on a business trip in China. You know, you could see the cultural sites, take in the culture, all of that. He had a different approach to it, so that's sort of weird. Here's another. So let's talk a little bit about his relationship with Donald Trump because obviously they're New York billionaires. They've probably come across each other and right now he's presenting himself as the guy who can take out Donald Trump. But what does he really think about Donald Trump? Take a look at this. I know Donald Trump, he's a great guy. He, he doesn't do everything he says, but he sure tries and I'm a big fan of Donald Trump. He's a big fan of Donald Trump. Is he the guy to get it done and taking out Trump, but he's a big fan of him? And look, here's the thing. Ah, he says he's a big fan, but he wasn't president then, right? I mean, we didn't know as much about Trump. Can't he be friends with Donald Trump? I want you to bear in mind what had already happened when that video happened. We had already been through the whole birther thing. Donald Trump had already been the public face of trying to take down Barack Obama by spreading a racist conspiracy theory about where he was born. And after all of that, after everybody knew who Donald Trump was, Mike Bloomberg is a big fan of him. That's an interesting thing to note. Uh, let's talk about something else involving Barack Obama. Uh, what does Bloomberg think about Obama's uh, effect on the country when he was president? We have a big problem in the world. I, th I would argue that today we are more segregated in America certainly than we were in terms of race than we were a dozen years ago. And yet we're just finishing up eight years with our first uh, black president. Why are we more separated than we were before? That is the question you've got to ask yourself. Uh, why during the Obama administration didn't we pull together? Well, I ask the president, that's his job really to pull people together. Okay, now if you're new to Bloomberg, I want you to really think about what that video means, especially uh, mashed up with the last one we showed you. Because you might be seeing these ads that are all over the place. They were running during the debate, maybe you saw them then, of Bloomberg just filling his ads with Barack Obama saying a nice thing about him. And you know, they're, they're together and there's a bunch of pictures about them. And he wants you to believe that Bloomberg, and, that Bloomberg and Obama, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. He's a big fan of him. I mean, note that in 2008 when Barack Obama was running for president, Bloomberg refused to endorse him. So just think about that for a second. But he just said in that video that the racial strife we experienced, the racist campaign against Barack Obama, that's Obama's fault. Not the Tea Party or Donald Trump who was literally doing the whole birther thing during that time. It's all on Obama, that's why we had more racism. So if there was an explosion of right wing hate groups, if there were white supremacist groups popping up, that's Obama's fault, that's what Bloomberg said. So just bear that in mind too. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of different issues. So one is um, privacy, you know, everybody's concerned in this digital age about people snooping on them, finding out too much about them. What does he think about, for instance, the NSA possibly uh, violating your privacy rights? One thing that, look, if you don't want it to be in the public domain, don't take that picture, don't write it down. In this day and age, you've got to be pretty naive to believe that the NSA isn't listening to everything and reading every email. <laughs> and incidentally, given how dangerous the world is, we should hope they are. <laughs> because this is really serious what's going on in the world. So that's Mike Bloomberg on the NSA. A couple different problems there that we should probably acknowledge. One is that he thinks that the government should be reading everything that you put out there. Reading all of your emails, it's not too much of a leap to imagine he wants them listening to your phone calls too. I mean, after all, it's a dangerous world. Your privacy rights, what are those really worth when there are dangerous people out there? 
Is that what you think? Is that what you believe about the world? Does Bloomberg match up with you there? That the government knows better, they should read everything you put out there. They should look at all of your photos because there's dangerous people. What a weirdly authoritarian way to approach the government. And if he was in charge of the NSA, what lines would he draw? What lines would he erase? It's a dangerous world after all, privacy. Really, who has time for that? But note that in the beginning, when he talked about, if you don't want it put out there, don't take that picture. That's not really about the NSA. That's some sort of weird shaming of people whose nude photos are leaked. What a weird thing to say. What an out of touch thing to say. And yet he says it quite openly. He's not, he's not ashamed to talk about these sorts of issues. Let's talk about another issue that he was wildly wrong on. And this is the trans community. So. He said this, if your conversation during a presidential election is about some guy wearing a dress and whether he, she, or it can go to the locker room with their daughter, that's not a winning formula for most people. I would argue that that sort of position in 2020 is not a winning formula to call trans individuals, trans women, specifically in this case, men in dresses or he, she, or it. Now look, in Bloomberg's defense, there are people who use this sort of language, Rush Limbaugh, talks in this way, you know, Ben Shapiro talks in this way. Not a lot of Democrats really, certainly not someone who wants to be the leader of the Democratic Party talks about that community in this way, especially as they're being targeted on a daily basis by people who wanna commit violence upon them, the government infringing on their rights. Is he gonna be their champion when he considers them men in dresses? When he considers them it's? I kind of doubt it, but it's important that you know. So let's talk about the economy. What does he think about wages? After all, this is like gonna be another populist election. You got Donald Trump who's gonna pretend to be a populist. People are really worried about the way the economy is going. He's worried too, but not necessarily the way you'd think. He said this, and understand this is in response to New York City when he was mayor, potentially passing a living wage bill. So that some workers who worked for companies that were being given government money would earn 10 or $11 an hour. And he said, it's interesting if you think about it. The last time we've really had a big managed economy was the USSR, and that didn't work out so well. It would be great if all jobs in the city paid a lot of money and had great benefits for the workers, not good for the employers. But if you force that, you will just drive businesses out of the city. So again, in response to a few workers getting 10 or $11 in New York City, which I would argue is not a living wage, he said that's like Soviet Russia. And it's gonna drive all the businesses out of New York City. So as president, is he gonna be supportive of raising wages? I mean, not only did he speak out against that bill, but you know what happened when they passed it? Uh, he vetoed it, and then thankfully they passed it over his veto, which is great. So he sued the city to block it, and when that didn't work, he sued the city a second time to overturn it. Like I like politicians who are passionate about the issues they care about. But that passion being funneled into trying to make sure that workers can't earn enough to actually live in the city they wanna live in, that's a weird way to expend your energy. And bear in mind, that's on a living wage. What about just a minimum wage? I mean, that's easy, right? Everybody supports raising the minimum wage. No, he doesn't support raising the minimum wage. He says, I've never supported raising the minimum wage. I mean, that's what we expect out of Donald Trump. Come on, he's literally said the same thing. Imagine how much glee Donald Trump is gonna have on the debate stage, pointing out that the Democratic nominee thinks that people on minimum wage are probably having it a bit too easy. Really, they think they should earn more money? That's him. But I mean, really, if you wanna talk about who Mike Bloomberg is, we've got to talk about sexism and sexual harassment because he has a record that could match anyone, including Donald Trump. Let's talk about a few of the things he's said. And bear in mind, this is just a sort of, like Whitman sampler, there's a lot more where this came from. In 1989, in response to one of his male employees who was gonna get married, he told the female employees, all of you girls line up to give him oral sex as a wedding present. Now was he joking? Sure, he'd say he was joking. You think it's funny? You think that's how he should treat his female employees? Imagine if, if I told female employees here, what would you think of me if I said that? But Bloomberg was very happy to make comments like that. Let's go through a few others. If women wanted to be appreciated for their brains, they'd go to the library instead of to Bloomingdale's. You know, because women are always shopping instead of studying. Men don't shop, they don't buy things, they go to the library. That's what he thinks about women. I know for a fact that any self-respecting woman who walks past a construction site and doesn't get a whistle will turn around and walk past again and again until she gets one. Because women not only don't mind being you know, catcalled at, 
they're desperate for it. They will like stop their day in its tracks and just go around and around this construction site until they get catcalled. That's Mike Bloomberg. He said of a female employee, I'd like to do that piece of meat. That was a woman whose career he had power over. He wants to do her and she's a piece of meat. Uh, he asked a woman employee after he was unhappy with the way a meeting had gone, quote, if the clients told you to lay down and strip naked so they could F you, would you do that too? Now he said on the debate stage last night, like, you know, women love working here. Yeah, I'm sure some women are perfectly happy, maybe the ones he hasn't talked to in that particular way. And understand, this is just the bare, like a little bit of Bloomberg on women, you know, telling a woman who got pregnant when she was working for him to kill it, counting all the women who got pregnant because it was so inconvenient for him, not to mention the many NDAs and sexual harassment suits that he is currently facing. So feel free to do a little bit more research on that. You're not gonna like what you end up finding. Okay, so let's go back to policy a little bit. A lot of people really are really favorable towards Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, some of those popular things that the American government has ever done. What does he think about these programs? What would he do as president? Now let's talk about intelligent cuts rather than the sequestering thing which would devastate defense. There is a ways to slowly decrease the benefits or raise the eligibility age for Medicare and for Social Security. There's a ways to have more copay on Medicaid, which will do two things. One, the users of the service will pay a little more, but two, they'll be they'll think twice before they use services. So the services they use will be those that are really needed and not stuff that would be nice to have. I want to ask you a serious question. Um, are you so well off that it doesn't make you nauseous the way it does for me to watch a guy worth $60 billion tell you that your wages shouldn't go up? And in fact, the programs that you're going to rely on later in life, those are probably due for some cuts. Taxes should definitely go down for billionaires, and that's going to cost some money. How do we make it up? We cut Social Security, we cut Medicare, we cut Medicaid, we raise the age for you to qualify for it. Now that was a few years ago, he's gonna tell you that he believes different, but he was already a powerful politician who had a control over many people's lives in New York City. That's what he wanted, he wanted those programs to be cut. Okay, we've already heard that Trump might do that. It makes us sick to think that Trump might do that. It should make us equally sick to think that the Democratic nominee would also be pushing for cuts to those programs that so many people depend on. Um, I wanna talk briefly though about foreign policy. What does he think is acceptable in foreign policy? So he was asked a question, this is a few years ago, when Israel had blown up some hospitals and schools in Palestine. Here's what he thought about that. Unfortunately, if Hamas hides among the innocent, the innocent are going to get killed because Israel just does not have any choice but to stop people firing Hamas, firing rockets at their citizens. They have a right to defend themselves, and America would do exactly the same thing. Doesn't the Geneva Conventions lay out that you cannot attack schools or hospitals? Nobody's attacking schools or hospitals, we're attacking Hamas. But Hamas is standing in the middle of a hospital. If they're standing in the middle of a hospital and they're firing rockets at your kids, what would you expect us to do? Would you really want us to not try to stop them? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if there are innocents getting killed at the same time, it's not Israel's fault. It's not their fault. You know, you blow up a hospital, you blow up a school, this whole international law thing, so inconvenient. I mean, you know, we could we could go in in person, try to take them out without killing a whole bunch of civilians, children, people who are sick in the hospitals. We could change our policy, you know, instead of just continuing decades of this policy of, you know, we lose a person, so we kill a hundred of theirs, and maybe we just ride that out for the rest of our lives. Um, he, if he becomes president, he is just going to stand on the sidelines and allow that cycle of violence to continue. While saying that it's okay for countries to violate human rights laws, to violate international laws involving war, he thinks that, that that's perfectly fine. And in fact, what could they possibly do otherwise? They're not responsible for that. He doesn't even truly acknowledge that these civilians are being killed. He says, ah, they're just wrong place, wrong time. They're not victims in that case, not at all. They're just ah, collateral damage, what are you gonna do? Now think about how he would approach other conflicts around the world. So Yemen is being devastated by Saudi Arabia. What if he has business with Saudi Arabia? You think he's really gonna care about the people in Yemen any more than he does the people in Palestine? Do we wanna take that gamble? Do we wanna do that?
Uh, I don't think so. But I want to turn to one more thing, and this is, to me, this is uh, possibly the worst thing about him. And it is his uh, expansion of stop and frisk, his defense of it, even years after it had been ruled unconstitutional. Um, when he was when he was asked about the fact that uh, almost only the people who were being stopped were black and brown, generally males between 18 and 25, uh, he was upset about those numbers, but not in the way you might expect. Take a look. I think we disproportionately stop whites too much. And minorities too little. Well, it's exactly I, the reverse of what they say. They are. I, I don't know where they went to school, but they certainly didn't take a math course. Well, ex exactly. Or so. a logic course. So he says now on the debate stage. Uh, so we saw that things were going out of control with stop and frisk. That the wrong people were being stopped. It was incredibly racist. And so I shut it down. Okay, uh, did he? I mean, he's the one saying, if you think that we were being discriminatory towards black and brown individuals, you don't know math. You don't know logic, you're too stupid to understand what I'm trying to do with stop and frisk. And finally, it was stopped. And for years afterward, he still talked fondly about the program. He is lying to you knowingly about the racist policy that he expanded massively during his time as mayor of New York. And he thinks that you won't ever learn the truth, that you'll just watch his little ads and you'll think that he can get it done. Okay, I'm hoping that people learn who he truly is. I'm trying to do my part and understand that this is just the beginning. I mean, we could talk about his spying on Muslim students in New York City, his comments about how we should effectively have death panels. If you get old and you get prostate cancer, we're not gonna do anything for you. It's a waste of money. He said that, it's on tape. He thinks that kids only support democratic socialism because they think it has to do with MySpace or something. So insulting to young voters, that's gonna help in a general election. He thinks that farmers are stupid in comparison to tech workers. They don't have enough gray matter to do more complicated work, paid sick leave. He thinks that's a stupid policy that shouldn't exist. He's been quoted saying that. Uh, I mean, telling a female employee to kill her baby because it's inconvenient to him. This is who he is, okay? You can watch his ads, you can see him scoop ice cream. It seems fun and happy. No, he's not that guy. That is just a, a billion dollar campaign to sell you rotten fruit effectively. Um, but people are gonna learn who he is. The question is, will they learn during the primary when there's still time? Or will we wait until we've chosen as a nominee and America discovers who he really is and he gets destroyed by Donald Trump in the general election? Okay, I guess we'll see, I guess we'll see. Okay, we're gonna take a short break. On the other side, Kenny Clips. Last night at the Democratic debate, Michael Bloomberg got destroyed over his numerous NDAs involving women who've been sexually harassed or discriminated against in the workplace. That was yesterday. Today, let's talk about his campaign NDAs. And joining us to do that is the man who broke the story, reporter for the nation, Kenneth Klippenstein III. Welcome to the Damage Report. Good to see you again, John. Uh, glad to have you here. Great work in, um, in breaking the story. So uh, break it down for us. Uh, what's going on with these campaign NDAs? So essentially, um, the Bloomberg campaign makes uh, many of its employees sign an NDA, and not just an NDA, but an extremely restrictive one. Um, my sources within the campaign tell me, and you know, many of these folks have been through a number of different campaigns in the past. Um, this is not a first campaign for many people. Say that this is by far the craziest, and I think the quote that I used in it was that it was um, bananas <laughs> was how they <laughs> described it because it is so restrictive, um, and it not just. You know, I, I you know I want to be fair here. Um, I understand if, for example, a campaign wants to keep something like an internal poll or something proprietary like that secret. That makes sense to me. But if you look at the language in this NDA, which numbered nine pages long, um, and when I talked to a, a government oversight group called Crew, uh, their uh, expert told me that often these agreements will be just a few sentences long, essentially saying, you know, for the duration of the campaign, don't talk to press outside of outside of formal channels. Um, this one goes on for just paragraphs and paragraphs, uh, and it seems very broadly construed into it and appears to apply to anything relating to the campaign. And it goes on indefinitely. There's no expiration date. So even after NDA. the just to be clear, even after the campaign is over, they're still muzzled. Exactly. Is that normal? No, um, not from what I'm told. Um, now there are other campaigns that use NDAs. Um, this has been a controversy for a while, and I do want people to 
you know, not think that this all began with Bloomberg. However, what you're seeing is an intensification of the secrecy around it. And that seems to mirror, as you point out earlier, um, the way that he's approached NDAs uh, in, in the corporate world. So I think that this story is a kind of nice illustration of how he's trying to import his um, practices in the uh, corporate and business world to a to the political domain, which I think is supposed to be more transparent and open for the public to understand what's going on. So I believe it's, it's referenced in your article that the campaign says that people who've been harassed, that wouldn't be covered under this NDA. They could still speak out about that. Do we, do we know for sure that that's the case? Well, the problem here is, and again, to mention crew, this is how they explained it to me and several other lawyers did as well, is that um, it has a carve out for if there's something that you legally need to disclose in response to, for example, a subpoena, you know, or a request to testify. But um, according to Crew, in the real world, uh, these cases very rarely reach that threshold because on it, there's a lot of time. There's a, there's going to be consequences for your career if you do that. So really, what this is blocking is any sort of um, you know uh, complaint that you might make um, that that. Uh, is something that perhaps you you want the behavior to stop, but you're not willing to go through this very public yeah. process of outing yourself in, in the case. And apparently, that's the vast majority of cases. You know, so I love this story, and people should definitely go take a look at it at the Nation for more details. I'm I'm curious though, in, in going forward, it seems like his campaign is going to be very prone to these sorts of leaks. Um, are you are you seeing much of that already? People reaching out to you? They're an extraordinary. Um, and uh, you know, people uh, talk to me saying, you know, where, you know, who, how do you know this is true? This is where, where was the individual you got this from? I've been talking to, I don't want to say how many, but a bunch of people <laughs> inside the campaign, and it's almost like um, a Game of Thrones type situation where uh, it's like the Lannisters are just throwing money left and right. And it turns out when you've got a essentially mercenary army, which I believe characterizes a lot of the Bloomberg campaign, they're not going to be very loyal. Yeah, that's just that's like I get that money is what they have, so that's what they're going to use. But but I've seen leaks in a couple of different areas, and and you have to wonder like some of these people who are being hired to to knock on doors to spread information online. Are, is their heart really going to be in it? Will these mercenaries fight like you know true believer soldiers? It it doesn't seem at this point like he's necessarily getting what he's paying for. Yeah, what I'm hearing on the part, and I don't want to get into sourcing too much, but just generally speaking to these folks, is um, you know, uh, a desperate need for money, and because of that, working for someone uh, for whom you know they feel, frankly, some shame working for. And I, I think that's why they're re- reaching out yeah. to the press to the extent that they are, not just the folks I talk to, but folks that they know as well. Yeah, and look, um, yeah, I know a lot of people have really hard. I, I don't want to shame people for taking a huge amount of money for what seems like it probably won't necessarily be much work. And so, if you want to do that, I totally endorse taking his money and doing a really Half a job at it, <laughs> or reaching out to me. I'm not going to complain about that either. Or both. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Ken, as always, thank you for joining us. Everybody, go check out uh, this and uh, the rest of Ken's work at the Nation. He's doing a great job over there. Great to talk to you again, John. Always good to have you on. Uh, and we're going to take one more break. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to what remains of the damage report, and I'm gonna keep it real. Not much remains. Uh, so that Bloomberg sketch uh, segment uh, obviously went on pretty long, but it was important, and I felt like we needed to do it. So we did have meanwhile in prepped, and there is important uh, news in both Africa and China. We are going to be covering that. It'll be on tomorrow's show, uh, and so that'll be our regularly scheduled show with Brett Ehrlich. And there's a couple things that you should definitely look forward to there. Not only meanwhile in, but we will be doing our now traditional Friday garbage people of the week sketch uh, sketch segment again. And uh, also there's a possibility we've been doing some top 10 lists, and Brett has pitched a top 10 people we hope someday run for president. And so if you have suggestions either for different lists or if you have people that you would like to see show up on that list, you can tweet at uh, the damage report, you can hashtag TDR live, uh, and, and you'll feel free to do that going forward. We're gonna try to integrate a little bit more of your commentary into the live show. Um, I did wanna say, uh, I've been encouraging you for like two years now to review the podcast on iTunes 
And I was just at this late date reminded that iTunes doesn't exist anymore, it's Apple Podcasts. You can see how much of an Apple fanboy I am, although this is an iPad. So on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Flinger or Flipper or whatever you're on, you can of course review the podcast. And if you do, we might read it. Like I'll read this one from Kevin is high who says, uh, socialist propaganda for Bernie Sanders one star. So thank you, Kevin, for that. I'm still gonna read it even if it's negative. Um, I don't think it's propaganda, but I guess it is socialist, so you got me there. So anyway, feel free to replace that as the most recent uh, review by going on Apple Podcasts and leaving a review and putting a five star rating there as well. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, throughout the episode. Uh, like I said, lots to look forward to on tomorrow's show. I'll also be on the main show today with Anna Kasparian, so I'll see you a little bit later on. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Darola. I'll see you soon.